Island of the Blue Dolphins by Scott O'Dell, as read by comedian Alex Elkin. Chapter 23. The hunters left many wounded otter behind them. Some floated in and died on the shore, and others I killed with my spear, since they were suffering and could not live. But I found a young otter that was not badly hurt. It lay in a bed of bull kelp, and I would have paddled by if Rontu had not barked. A strand of kelp was wound around its body, and I thought it was sleeping, for often before they go to sleep they anchor themselves in this way to keep from drifting off. Then I saw there was a deep gash across its back. The otter did not try to swim away as I drew near and reached over the side of the canoe. They have large eyes, especially when they are young, but this ones were so large from fear and pain that I could see my reflection in them. I cut the kelp that held it and took it to a tide pool behind the reef which was sheltered from the waves. The day was calm after the storm and I caught two fish along the reef. I was careful to keep them alive because the otter will not eat anything that is dead and left them in the pool. This was early in the morning. That afternoon I went back to the pool. The fish had disappeared and the young otter was asleep floating on its back. I did not try to treat its wound with herbs because salt water heals and the herbs would have washed off anyway. I brought two fish every day and left them in the pool. The otter would not eat while I was watching. Then I brought four fish, and these also disappeared, and finally six, which seemed to be the right number. I brought them whether the day was calm or stormy. The otter grew and its wound began to heal, but still I stayed in the pool. And now when I came, it would be waiting for me and would take the fish from my hand. The pool was not big, and it could easily have gotten out and away into the sea, yet it stayed there and slept or waited for me to come with food. The young otter now was the length of my arm and very glossy. It had a long nose that came to a point and many whiskers on each side and the largest eyes I have ever seen. They would watch me all the time I was at the pool, following me, whatever I did, and when I said something, they would move around in a very funny way. In a way, too, that made pain come to my throat because they were gay and sad also. For a long time I called it Otter, as I had called Rontu, Dog. Then I decided to give the Otter a name. The name was Monani, which means little boy with large eyes. It was a hard task catching fish every day, especially if the wind was blowing and the waves were high. Once, when I could only catch two and drop them into the pool, Monani ate them quickly and waited for more. When he found that that was all that I had, he swam around in circles looking at me reproachfully. The waves were so high the next day that I could not fish on the reef even at low tide, and since I had nothing to give him, I did not go to the pool. It was three days before I could catch fish. When I went there again, the pool was deserted. I knew that he would leave some day, but I felt bad that he had gone back to the sea and that I would never catch fish for him again, nor would I know him if I saw him again in the kelp, for now that he had grown and his wound had healed, he looked like all the others. Soon after the Aleuts had left, I moved back to the headland. Nothing had been harmed except the fence, which I mended, and in a few days the house was the same as before. The only thing that worried me was that all the abalones I had gathered in the summer were gone. I would need to live from day to day on what I could catch, trying to get enough on the days when I could fish to last through the times when I could not. Through the first part of the winter, before Monani swam away, this was sometimes hard to do. Afterwards, it was not so hard, and Rontu and I always had enough to eat. While the Aleuts were on the island, I had no chance to catch little smelts and dry them. So the nights that winter were dark, and I went to bed early and worked only during the day. But still, I made another string for my fishing spear, many hooks of abalone shell, and last of all, earrings to match the necklace Tutuk had given me. These took a long time, for I searched the beach many mornings when the tide was out before I found two pebbles of the same color as the stones in the necklace and soft enough to cut. The holes in the earrings took even more time, for the stones were hard to hold. But when I was done, and had rubbed them bright in fine sand and water, and fastened them with bone hooks to fit my ears, they were very pretty. On sunny days, I would wear them with my cormorant dress and the necklace, and walk along the cliff with Rontu. I often thought of Tutok, but on these days especially, I would look off into the north and wish that she were here to see me. I could hear her talking in her strange language, and I would make up things to say to her and things for her to say to me. End of chapter 23. Chapter 24. Spring again was a time of flowers, and water ran in the ravines and flowed down to the sea. Many birds came back to the island, 
Tainor and Lurai built a nest in the tree where they were born. They built it of dry seaweed and leaves and also with hairs of Ronchu's back. Whenever he was in the yard while it was being made, they would swoop down if he was not looking and snatch a beak full of fur and fly away. This he did not like, and he finally hid from them until the nest was finished. I had been right in giving a girl's name to Lorai, for she laid speckled eggs and, with some help from her mate, hatched two ugly fledglings, which soon became beautiful. I made up names for them and clipped their wings, and before long they were as tame as their parents. I also found a young gull that had fallen from its nest to the beach below. Gulls make their nests high on the cliffs, in hollow places on the rocks. These places are usually small, and often I had watched a young one teetering on the edge of the nest and wondered why it did not fall. They seldom did. This one, which was white with a yellow beak, was not badly hurt, but he had a broken leg. I took him back to the house and bound the bones together with two small sticks and sinew. For a while he did not try to walk. Then, because he was not old enough to fly, he began to hobble around the yard. With the young birds and the old ones, the white gall and Rontu, who was always trotting at my heels, the yard seemed a happy place. If only I had not remembered to talk. If only I had not wondered about my sister Ulape, where she was, and if the marks she had drawn upon her cheeks had proved magical. If th they had, she was now married to Nanko and was the mother of many children. She would have smiled to see all of mine, which were so different from the ones I had always wished to have. Early that spring I started to gather abalones, and I gathered many, taking them to the headland to dry. I wanted to have a good supply ready if the Aleuts came again. One day, when I was on the reef filling my canoe, I saw a herd of otter in the kelp nearby. They were chasing each other, putting their heads through the kelp and then going under and coming up again in a different place. It was like a game we used to play in the brush when there were children on the island. I looked for Monani, but each of them was like the other. I filled my canoe with abalones and paddled toward the shore, one of the otter following me. As I stopped, he dived and came up in front of me. He was far away, yet even then I knew who it was. I never thought that I would be able to tell him from the others, but I was so sure it was Monani that I held up one of the fish I had caught. Otter swam very fast, and before I could take a breath, he had snatched it from my hand. For two moons I did not see him, and then one morning while I was fishing, he came suddenly out of the kelp. Behind him were two baby otter. They were about the size of puppies, and they moved along so slowly that from time to time Monani had to urge them on. Sea otter cannot swim when they are first born, and have to hold on to their mother. Little by little she teaches her babies by brushing them away with her flippers, then swimming around them in circles until they learn to follow. Monani came close to the reef, and I threw a fish into the water. He did not snatch it as he usually did, but waited to see what the young otter would do. When they seemed more interested in me than in food, and the fish started to swim away, he seized it with his sharp teeth and tossed mm -hmm. it in front of them. I threw another fish into the water for Monani, but he did the same things as before. Still, the babies would not take the food, and at last, tired of playing with it, swam over and began to nuzzle him. Only then did I know that Monani was their mother. Otter mate for life, and if their mother dies, and f the father will often raise the babies as best he can. This is what I thought had happened to Monani. I looked down at the little family swimming beside the reef. Monani, I said. I am going to give you a new name. It is Wanani, which fits you because it means girl with the large eyes. The young otter grew fast and soon were taking fish from my hand, but Wanani liked abalones better. She would let the abalone I tossed to her sink to the bottom and then dive and come up holding it against her body with the rock held in her mouth. Then she would float on her back and put the abalone on her breast and strike it again and again with the rock until the shell was broken. She taught her young to do this, and sometimes I sat on the reef all morning and watched the three of them pounding the hard shells against their breasts. If all otters did not eat abalones this way, I would have thought it was a game played by one or any just to please me. But they all did, and I always wondered about it, and I wonder to this time. After that summer, after being friends with one or any and her young, I never killed another otter. I had an otter cape for my shoulders, which I used until it wore out, but never again did I make a new one. Nor did I ever kill another cormorant for its beautiful feathers, though they have long, thin necks and make ugly sounds when they talk to each other. Nor did I kill seals for their sinews, using instead kelp to bind the things that I needed. Nor did I kill another wild dog, nor did I try to spear another sea elephant. Ulape would have laughed at me, and others would have laughed too, my father most of all. Yet this is the way I felt about the animals who had become my friends and those who were not, but in time could be. 
If Ulapi and my father had come back and laughed, and all the others had come back and laughed, I still would have felt the same way, for animals and birds are like people, too, though they do not talk the same or do the same things. Without them, the earth would be an unhappy place. End of chapter 24